for millennium. People feared the long, dark days of winter, once feared as the possible end of the world. So tribes in Europe built bonfires, reveled and feasted together in the growing darkness as an act of defiance, exercising their fears and warming their hearts and faith by the inner light of their shared humanity and hearts. It seems the winter festivals are as old as the darkness and light. The fourth century Christian church leaders worried when these feasts which were everywhere lapsed into debauchery and became a threat to the social order, their social order. So in a clever piece of ecclesiastical footwork, they dubbed these feasts, these frost-bitten frolics, as a celebration of the birthday of the Christ child. Yes! Out of the deepest darkness they preached, a light has been born into the world, the light of the Immaculate Birth. Now, this squeamish mix of partying and piety that we all know so well even today was also born in 400 AD. And church leaders have never ceased to fret over the loose cannon nutty side of Christmas. During the early celebrations of Christmas Day or Christag in the lower Shenandoah Valley in the late 1700s, a German newspaper echoed this concern, saying, In these days when candles are set up in Christian churches containing a wooden likeness of Christ and are being rocked to the accompaniment of lullabies, it is either idolatry or comes pretty close to it. In other words, no one juggled the paradox balancing paganism and piety more bemusedly than the hordes of German settlers who were either Lutherans or of the Reformed Church, who flooded into Pennsylvania, Western Maryland, and the Shenandoah Valley, bringing the folkways from their native country. Throughout most of the 1700s, the native customs for celebrating Christmas were strong in the German community, and the centerpiece was the Christmas tree, which they decorated, which Charles Dickens in another century called the Little German Toy, by the early 1800s, though, celebrating Christmas in the Shenandoah Valley in Western Maryland had become something of a hybrid, mixing customs from Ireland, Scotland, England, and Germany. And one custom that didn't survive was the Christmas tree. While at least the celebration of the feasting side of Christmas was going strong in these rural villages, elsewhere, everywhere, urbanization, and the Industrial Revolution, social change was destroying Christmas as they had known it, both in Europe and in the United States. People felt rootless, and by the 1840s, people yearned for an idealized, perfect Christmas celebration that, in fact, had never really existed. We owe much of our modern Christmas to four people, Charles Dickens, Washington Irving, Thomas Nast, and a couple, Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, who especially put the Christmas tree back on the map. So, the custom of decorating that German toy began a resurgence, and it started its way back into Virginia and the United States. It was traveling German merchants and emigrants who were leaving their unstable country in the 1830s that brought the Christmas tree back to life everywhere else. One of these missionaries of the Christmas tree was a 20-year-old student named Charles Frederick Ernest Minigarod, who was attending the University of Giesen in 1834. And after being jailed for political reasons, he found it was a good time to leave upon his release. In 1842, he arrived in Williamsburg, where he procured a position in the faculty of the College of William and Mary. 
and he became a frequent guest to the home of Judge Nathaniel Beverly Tucker, an esteemed law professor. And what Charles Friedrich Ernest Minigerode gave the Tuckers was the idea of the Christmas tree. Now the first people to bring the Christmas tree to the lower Shenandoah Valley were the Bedingers. In the spring of 1853, Henry Bedinger, his wife Caroline, and their two children set sail for Denmark in Copenhagen where Henry was going to be the first American ambassador to the court there. All of his family returned early in the fall of 1856, bearing with them a new idea. Their young daughter, Mary, wrote about it later in life, and she noticed when she came back to celebrate Christmas in the winter of 1856 in Jefferson County that nobody else had ever even heard of a Christmas tree. It's an idea that died with the first immigrants from Germany. She wrote, at Christmas in Copenhagen, everybody had a Christmas tree. But this was an entire novelty to us then, and when my mother returned, she dressed the first tree our friends either in Flushing, New York, or Virginia had ever seen. Now everybody is familiar with the custom, which has so often degenerated into a perfunctory exhibition for Sunday schools and charities. So, as we all know, the Christmas tree came home and came home to stay, and we still have our Christmas trees. But Mary Bettinger Mitchell wrote in her later years a thought which still has meaning to us today, and she wrote, I do not know why it is that so many beautiful and touching observances, when transplanted to this country, lose grace and significance, if they do not actually become tawdry and vulgar. I should be sorry to seem to imply that there was anything essentially vulgar in the American mind, but it is certain that customs adopted as fashions wither in our hands. We push the form to its extreme, but the spirit dies. So the odd, uneasy combination of the spiritual side of Christmas and the partying side of Christmas continue until this day. <laughs> 